following program is funded in part by grants from the Florida Endowment for the Humanities, the Norfolk Southern Corporation, and the Florida Public Broadcasting Service Incorporated. Dub Warrior is a black Seminole. He is descended from Africans who escaped slavery and united with the Seminole Indians in Florida more than two centuries ago. There's no future without a past. It's a fact. If you're coming from nowhere, you're going nowhere. 1776. Thirteen American colonies rebel against British rule, but Florida remains loyal to England. The river dividing Georgia and Florida becomes an international border. Hundreds of blacks, enslaved on American plantations, escape south, finding refuge and allies among the Seminole Indians in northern Florida. Enraged slave owners enlist the United States government to destroy the Black and Seminole Alliance. But in 50 years of fighting, the bond between Black and Seminole is not broken. Charlie Wilson is dedicated to passing on the history of her Seminole ancestors. So many blacks were in slavery and we would say died for being black and we survived. The heritage of these black Seminoles is unique. Their existence as a people proves that whites failed to destroy the alliance they most feared. They knew if there was ever a joint effort that they wouldn't be able to control. They couldn't control either, either race, the black or the Indians. The Indians were skipped, but then you had your blacks, some of them were domesticated by the whites. They knew their ways, they knew their, their weaknesses. So together, what do you get? A formidable force. Because they, they, they're stronger together. American slave owners feared the united strength of the Africans they had enslaved and the Indians whose land they had stolen. This combined African and Indian force soon became Florida's best defense against American invaders. A 1783 treaty ended the American Revolution. Control of Florida returned to Spain, the territory's original colonial ruler. As the Spanish moved into St. Augustine, the Americans demanded the return of escaped slaves. But the Spanish had other plans. Historian Jane Landers discovered records documenting that the Spanish encouraged a military alliance between blacks and Indians. Sometimes you will see on the list detachments of the free black militias specifically posted out at Indian villages. The black and Indian militias were the, the military force on the frontier. So the Spanish would be negotiating at diplomatic levels with the United States, but they would send out the Indians and the blacks to do the fighting. 
And the free blacks in St. Augustine were very connected many times to the blacks that were living in the Seminole villages. What we now call the Seminoles were living in their own villages, uh, for instance, very large settlements near what is now Gainesville, Florida, in the Alachua Savannah area. A close relationship developed between Seminoles and blacks on this prairie. Some white observers mistakenly assumed the blacks were slaves to the Seminoles. It really was not a slave-master relationship. It was more a, a free existence. They intermarried. The children were accepted in the tribes quite easily. And they had a common interest in wanting to hold that land where they were living freely. They had acquired big herds of cattle themselves. They had nice fields and homes. But Georgian slave owners raged against the Black and Seminole Alliance. They demanded that the U.S. government capture the former slaves and their children, even if it meant invading Spanish Florida, which they did in 1812. Blacks and Indians fought so fiercely and with such determination that they routed the Georgians who were invading Florida. They even fought and defeated a U.S. Marine contingent that was assisting those Georgians. But within a few months, the Georgians were back with fresh troops. They invaded the prairie, pillaged the towns, burned hundreds of log homes. These few excavated remains tell of a settled life destroyed forever. The Seminoles scattered south. Many of the black Seminoles disappeared to a place where the invading Americans would not find them for a long time. The Seminoles were, were pretty well crippled and dispersed in a number of different directions beginning about 1813. One of the spots they came, I think, was in this vicinity here. This map drawn more than 150 years ago in the diary of an American military engineer led anthropologist Brent Wiseman to this remote location on the Withlacoochee River. The diary's author, Henry Prince, called this place Boggy Island. We're now in the middle of Boggy Island, high and dry in the midst of river swamp all around. This is the area described by Henry Prince as being cleared and cultivated by the Black Seminoles during the Second Seminole War period. It was in this area here, now overgrown as a very beautiful mesic hammock, that the Black Seminoles grew corn, beans, several varieties of squash, pumpkins, and along the edge of the river, sugarcane. We know very little about how these black Seminoles were living. We don't know what their settlement looked like. We don't know anything about their daily lives. On the other hand, we have a very informative historical resource below our feet, a relatively undisturbed archeological site out here somewhere waiting to be further explored. And it's quite possible that archaeology will hold the key to developing a real history of these black Seminoles in Florida. The black Seminoles at Boggy Island stayed out of sight, while another group of blacks occupied this highly visible spot, the location of what was called Negro Fort on the Apalachicola River in Spanish Florida. The British built this fort during the War of 1812. They retreated in 1814 and left the fort and extensive artillery to blacks and Indians settled along the river. American slave owners detested this evidence of black strength so close to their plantations. Young General Andrew Jackson ordered the fort destroyed, regardless of the ground it stands on. On July 27, 1814, a lucky shot from an American frigate hit the fort's magazine. The explosion killed almost 300 blacks and Indians. In 1817, Jackson invaded Spanish Florida with the excuse of routing out blacks and Indians. The Spanish didn't stop the Americans, and by 1821, Florida belonged to the United States.
New settlers pushed into Florida, demanding more and more of the valuable Seminole lands. Violence between settlers and Seminoles continued, even after the U.S. government restricted the Seminoles to a reservation. Slave catchers made a living kidnapping black Seminoles. As president, Andrew Jackson demanded that all Seminoles be removed west and that all black Seminoles be sold into slavery. The Seminoles refused. Thousands of U.S. troops occupied the Florida Territory. By 1835, the Seminole resistance galvanized into war. The older ancestors, they used to tell us about that when I was a kid. And they said that they fought down there in the Seminole War for seven years. The significance of the Negro presence in the first place was that it was a basic cause of the war. The erection of these forts, Foster and certain others, I think indicated beyond any doubt to the uh, Indians that the United States wanted in the long run to push them out because several of the forts, like Fort Foster, were in the reservation. And there wouldn't be any basic purpose in having the forts in the reservation if you were gonna leave the Indians in it and leave them alone. The constant uh, leakage of slaves from South Carolina, Georgia, down here uh, so aggravated the slaveholders that they were determined to wipe out this refuge. The blacks were among the more important guides. They were the sole interpreters. There wasn't anybody else who could interpret. And as warriors, they, as long as they were on the Indian side, the people at the time uh, always stated that the blacks were as good fighters as the Indians, if not better. Uh, and so their significance is major. I think you would find that the freedmen was the one that was doing most of the fight. Mm -hmm. And they fought to be free. The high command, Jessup, changed his position several times. At one point, he said, every slave that can be uh, demonstrated to have belonged to a white has to go back the whites. And if the Indians don't turn them in, we'll hang anyone who catch, who wasn't turned in or who didn't turn them in. But Jen Jessup's end position, after several flip-flops, was uh, we aren't going to make slave catchers out of the United States Army. The Seminoles fought until the U.S. government agreed that the black Seminoles would also be allowed to go west. While some Seminoles never left the Florida swamps, the majority of Seminoles, Indian and black, sailed from Tampa Bay, up the Mississippi and Arkansas rivers to Indian Territory. Here, Seminoles joined thousands of southeastern Indians, forced west by the U.S. government. This countryside now bears the name of Seminole County, Oklahoma. It is headquarters for the Seminole Nation in the West. Twin brothers, Lawrence and Lance Cudjo, stay deeply involved in the affairs of the Seminole Nation, even while Lance recovers from a severe stroke. Their ancestor, King Cudjo, was a translator and advisor to the Seminoles in Florida. Hello, Lord. Yeah. Have a seat. Have a seat. Finally made it. Lawrence meets with Seminole Chief Tanyan. They prepare for a council meeting later that night. And whichever the way this person votes, that's the way they're going to go. Lawrence Yeah. In Oklahoma, 
Black Seminoles are called Seminole Freedmen. Two of the 14 tribal bands of the Seminole Nation are Freedmen bands. Seminole Freedmen have full tribal status, unlike any other group of blacks associated with native peoples. When they had that brutal war in Florida, the freedmen were so well tied with the Seminole tribe that they adopted them, made them full citizens of the Seminole Nation. Now that, their constitution was a lot different than the Creeks and a lot of the rest of them because they really were blood brothers. In fact, there was a lot of marrying, intermarrying in that tribe. Ben Warrior is the head of the Doser Barkas Band. Ben Warrior's ancestors came to Indian Territory as independent tribal members to farm the land and live free. When the government made an agreement with the freedmen to cease fighting and come to Oklahoma with the Indians, so the freedmen made an agreement that they, they would come, but they had to come with their guns on. So you see, the freedmen came here with their guns on. And they said the freedmen were slave to the Indian, but slave don't wear no gun. But in 1839, when the Florida Seminoles first arrived at Fort Gibson on the Arkansas River, slave catchers were close behind. Many black Seminoles stayed at the fort and built this commissary for the government. The army protected them from slave catchers, but still called them slaves. The persecution continued. In 1849, blacks among the Seminoles were legally declared slaves. In defiance, Seminole war hero John Horse and his partner Wildcat rebelled. They led 300 followers out of Indian territory into Mexico. They chose Mexico, I imagine, because uh, it, was, it was supposed to be free over there. You could do what you wanted. If they had stayed over here, they'd be back in slavery again. The Seminoles lived near the Rio Grande for 20 years, where they served as border patrol for the Mexican government. The Seminoles' expertise as horsemen and sharpshooters made an impression, even on the American side of the river, where they were still considered slaves. Soon after the Civil War abolished slavery in the United States, the U.S. Army recruited the Seminoles as border scouts. They were stationed here at Fort Clark, Texas. The Army promised wages and land. They came over here to help the United States government in 1870 to form the scouts, to scout for the government. That's why they came back and they promised them land and that they would take care of them. And each man that came over and they used him as a scout, would get the same pay as a private. And then they would let the rest of the family stay on the land. But the guys that were scouts would take care of the rest of the, guy, of the people, you know, as the families. And that's the way they did. They stayed together. And if I had, you had. The Seminole Scouts served the U.S. government for 34 years. They earned three Congressional Medals of Honor. <laughs> Descendants of the Seminole Scouts had to obtain permission to visit this land at Fort Clark, where their parents and grandparents once had homes. And the road to the cemetery is right That's up above right. there. That's right. Just back down over that. Not changed so much the hardly. Yeah, Isn't it pathetic? Fine. <laughs> the army kept them there until they thought it was peaceful enough. Then after they because they didn't need them any, any longer. Well, they just put them off, tell them they had to, had, to, had to leave. And I learned that, of course, there would be some dissensions about it because they had, had never thought of it, had never thought they would ever have to leave. They had established their homes and was getting along comfortably. Fort Clark is no longer a military base, but a private residential club. 
when they first opened up here, you paid to go in the gates or get down in the, on the reservation and all. And that was one of the reasons why I joined, because I felt that I was born down there. That's our land. And they shouldn't, and they shouldn't have taken it. And there is, there is a bit of bitterness. Seminole Scout families lost their Fort Clark homes. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. While Seminole freedmen in Oklahoma were being swindled out of land allotted to them from the original Seminole reservation. The justification uh, for the allotment of reservations was that uh, American Indians would not be able to become quote unquote civilized until they were taught the value of private ownership of land. Anthropologist Rebecca Bateman spent a year conducting research among the freedmen in Seminole County. In 1897, a tribal role was created in which uh, the attempt was made to list all of the Indian and freedmen members of the tribe in preparation for preparing the allotment roll. They paid $10 to get on the roll, I hear. And if you were, if you came from Florida with some of the Indians or your ancestors and they were on the rolls, well, come on down to buy lineal descent and they allocated land. We got the map, I mean, everybody they issued that land to. Some of them did real well because they, he got land that had oil reserves on it. Of course, that land has gotten away. We had some of the same conditions they had down in uh, Florida where they just told people to just hold them out of deed and told people to get off the land they own. You know. There was a massive grab for land by white speculators who did so by taking advantage of the uh, illiterate allottees, both Indian and black, but particularly the freedmen. See, there's a lot of things that uh, she found in the documents that was extremely negative. It made, made, the, gov made the state look bad. Yeah. They, that shouldn't be brought out. That's why it's not in the history books. They're not gonna put it in the history books where how they got over a lot of this land. How they, they're not gonna put that in the history books. People today, especially elderly people, some of whom are old enough to have been original allottees, they remember this period very well. Helen Thurman, born in 1902, was listed on the allotment rolls as a newborn. Now, which is which? That's I'm Lance. I'm Lance. He's Lance. Lance. Mm -hmm. Lance. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Come in. Yeah. I've got a good farm. I'm a newborn. You were newborn. Uh-huh. Yeah. All the newborn just got 40 acres of land. See, well, some true. got 60, uh, the older ones, first class land. Mm -hmm. They got 60 acres. 60 acres. Mm -hmm. Granddaddy, his name was John Cudgel. Uh, he got a good grade of land, just right east of Middle Creek Church, down off in that bottom. Oh, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. But after he passed away, so many heirs, one sell, this one sell, and some they petitioned them out, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't get nothing, didn't give, give them nothing, but they, yet and still they took it. They had some bitter fighting. Mm -hmm. and that's the way a lot of the land went. The freedman town of Wewoka was founded by John Horse on land belonging to the original Seminole Reservation. The Seminole Nation Museum in Wewoka holds reminders of a past when blacks and Indians shared a community, a past when their children attended the same schools. But land allotment and the segregation laws which came with Oklahoma statehood eroded the black and Indian bond.
Children with Seminole heritage, like Frederica Cudjo, must rely on grandparents to pass on their unique history. Well, I found out that uh, my grandfather was uh, a freedman in the Seminole. I never knew that. And I never knew that he, you, he used to be, live in Seminole. Kenny Sally, here, Tommy Todd, here, Edna Walden. Here. They stayed. The attendance list of this class shows mostly Anglo names, passed on from slavery days, while Frederica Cudjo's West African surname tells of centuries of black independence. An independence made possible by the Seminole Alliance. One nation. gather here, I would like to relate some of the history that the Seminole Indians were part of. Private Payne was born in Florida before the Seminole tribe was removed to Indian territory. While in his 30s, he enlisted into the Seminole Negro Indian Scouts on November 12th. This is more than a commemoration for heroic ancestors. These descendants of the Seminole Scouts are self-appointed historians committing to public record an American past which their children do not learn in school. They trying to keep all of this from the blacks. You don't hear that much in the history books about any blacks. Let them know your parents were slaves, your parents weren't, or whatever the case may be. But in order for them to get it together now, they've got to know where they come from. This is just a brief history of the Seminole Negro Scouts in which we are all a part of that ancestry. Word of it. Make old soft hard kit, my poor kit, tall way, tall low for my happy opportunity. <laughs> now I can't tell you, Dad could tell you how, what, what that meant. I couldn't. This program was funded in part by grants from the Florida Endowment for the Humanities, the Norfolk Southern Corporation, and the Florida Public Broadcasting Service Incorporated. Hello, I'm John Amos. Escape from slavery wasn't always to the north. Hundreds of blacks turned south, where they found refuge and allies among the Seminole Indians in Florida. This bold black and Indian alliance so threatened American slavery that the U.S. government would wage two wars to destroy it. But the black and Seminole bond was not broken. Join me for Black Warriors of the Seminole, 